and you are there. you're live. I'm live. Thank goodness for that. No problem. Right. Okay. So as um, it's really just, uh, been suggested, to the, to this particular session is all about interfaces into um, Prophecy Historia. So let's just have a look, a quick overview on what interfaces are actually available out there. So here we have this sort of historian archiver and historically we, we have a number of interfaces that we support. So starting off, we have the user API. So that allows us to read and write data to the historian at extremely high speed. Uh, most of this is done, the samples are all in sort of Visual Studio, C and C++. Then as we move on from that, um, we, we have a sort of an SDK type interface. Um, it has more functionality than that provided by the user API. So this time, not only can we interact with the data, but we can also look at archives, messages, collectors, and alarm and events. And again, uh, we provide some samples in Visual Basic. The next interface that's available is subject to um, the installation options. You're able to install a, a, an OPC HDA server. So many of you are familiar with OPC DA, but there's also an option here for historical data access, hence the OPC HDA. So you could connect a standard um, OPC HDA compliant client directly into Historian. But now let's turn our attention perhaps to some of the, the newer interfaces that we have. So those of you that have a, 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 a new version or a newer uh, version of Historian, this came in at version eight, we have a, a effectively a Java um, SDK kit. And really this offers ex an extensive range of features. It's fairly low level type access, um, but we can interact with the tags, we can interact with the archives, data stores, statistics, users. Um, and so in many cases, um, this is like to supersede the functionality available in both the user AP APIs and the SDK COM objects. The next interface, which I, I, I really want to talk about it in some detail, is the OLEDB interface. Um, there is um, some extensive documentation on this. Um, and in many cases, it's a little bit like, you know, SQL, maybe, uh, you know, a structured query language which we can use to uh, query the data um, and it's it's widely used for reporting. So for example, you could run a report uh, and display the data in sort of SQL Server reporting services. Uh, you could uh, retrieve the data into Excel, Dream reports, etc. So it's, it's a widely used reporting interface. What it doesn't allow you to do is insert data or update data. It's purely data retrieval. Uh, and the next interface, which again, what I would like to start covering in, in more detail, is really the new REST APIs. Now, these became available with Historian version 7 and have been extensively um, sort of upgraded for, from version 7 when they were first introduced up to version 8.1. Um, from this, you can query data. You can even write data um, back into Historian. You can maintain tags with it and some of the new features at 8.1 allows you to actually manage collectors from it. Um, this is really quite attractive and many of our newer software products within GE communicate with Historian through the REST interface. So, but firstly, let's go and have a look at the Historian OLEDB interface in a bit more detail. And this is based on uh, sort of Microsoft uh, type technology. Um, the original concept behind it is that um, it would replace perhaps the sort of ODBC um, interfaces that, that we know today. Um, as it is, probably that, that's not the case anymore. Um, and in order to make it available to you, you do need to select it during the installation routine of the Historian Archiver. But what this does do is it allows uh, data to be queried through SQL and underneath it all, although we talk about it being time series, what really happens here is that the, the data manifests itself as what I will describe as a series of views. So you can't necessarily go in there and touch, you can't open up a view and see the raw data, but you can query the view. And as I said earlier, 
there's no support for insert or updates. Now, there are a wide number of tables available here, but for most people, we're probably interested in three particular key cat tables here. There's what I call IH raw data. So this is where we store all the raw data uh, from the tags. Then there is IH tags, which stores all, all the, tag, the tags themselves about, you know, the name of tags, description, where it gets the data from, how often it's updated, etc. And then there's a, a table called IH trend, which again is useful if you want to pull back multiple columns of data at the same time. So how can we perhaps use this interface? So we're going to start off by just looking at a fairly simple uh, example here. And uh, this is just uh, an example of I want to recover raw data from historians. So let's just sort of talk you through this particular query. As you can see, it looks very much like an SQL query, but with perhaps uh, a few extra features. So the first point to note here is that there's a concept called sampling mode. How do I want to sample the data? In this particular case, I want it. I want the raw data and I want it by time. Um, so I don't want it. I don't want it to interpolate the data. I want the actual data points that have been stored in Historian. And I want to retrieve that data by time. Alternatively, I could perhaps retrieve that data by the number uh, um, of value. So I could say, you know, I want to retrieve that data by count and I want the last 100 values that have been stored. But in this particular case, I'm going to, I want it by time. The next thing that's important here is how much data do I want to bring back? Or rather, I should say, this is a limit to the amount of data I want to bring back. So I've said here is, I do not want to bring back more than 50,000 rows. And then thereafter, the query becomes relatively straightforward. Please give me the timestamp of the data, the tag name, the quality of the data, and the value from this table called IH raw data. And the next point to note here is it understands both absolute times, but also the idea of relative times. So in this particular case, I'm saying, please bring me back all of that data starting which is one hour old one hour old or, or, or newer of for this particular tag and again um there is a concept of quality you know in, in early in earlier sessions we talked about quality so i can ensure what i only want to bring back data of good quality and again you know very much like sql i can put an order clause in there so how do i want to order the data Okay, that, that's a little bit uh, an example, perhaps, which is a little bit more complex. And this time I, I want to actually interpolate the data. So I actually can't guarantee necessarily, depending upon how I set up my uh, collection routine, at what um, frequency that data will actually be stored in um, in the archive, because we've already talked about in previous sessions about uh, dead banding. But nevertheless, I may store the data. Um, I may want to. I may want to acquire that, uh, retrieve that data less frequently. And therefore I can sort of say to it, please bring me back an interpolated view of that data. So in this particular case, again, I'm putting a, a, a limit on the number of rows I want to bring back. I want to bring back the data for the last day, hence start time is now minus one day. I want to finish it at time now, and I want to bring back, I want to interpolate that data, and I want to bring back one result every one minute. And again, I can execute that query and off it will go, bring me back that data and order it by time. Now let's try and make it a little bit more interesting. Let's suppose I'm a maintenance engineer and I have a pump or a motor or a piece of equipment. And that piece of equipment, I store that status of that piece of equipment uh, in Historian. So, you know, stopped running, etc. And I'm interested in maintenance. And in this particular case, the challenge I'm suggesting is I want to know since that pump was last maintained, how many hours has it run? Or indeed, how many times has it started? Because this allows us perhaps to, to plan maintenance. So again, th th there are enhancements put into um, OLE OLEDB implementation here, but perhaps you wouldn't find in ordinary SQL Server. And so, so the first question is here is, 
how many times has this motor pump has transitioned to a state of running? And we have some specialized terminology in here to do with things like state count and a state value. So in this particular case, I'm asking it to actually tell me how many times, hence the sum of value uh, from this uh, particular table where this pump, pump 101, and I have a, a special sampling mode called calculated with a state a calculation mode of count the number of times it has transitioned to a state where the state value is one. Uh, in this particular case, I, I'm just sort of running this over the last hour. So this shows an extension here, but perhaps it might be useful. In a similar way, I might want to know how long a particular a pump or a process has been in a, in a particular state. So again, very similar to the previous example, but this time, rather than talk about state count, we can talk about state time. So how long has it been in that particular state? And now let's look at this idea of a process engineer. So this is an example of what is generally called a filtered query. So I have a reactor in there and I'm producing some form of batch. And with that batch, there is a batch number. At the same time, within Historian, I also, also store information about that uh, batch. So I might have a temperature tag going into Historian. And the question here that the process engineer is trying to solve is, please give me all the temperatures at, say, at a particular X minute intervals for when I was running batch Y. So what we can do up here is, so this first part of the query is sort of the one that you've sort of seen before, and it's saying really, give me the temperatures, and I want to interpolate that, that data um, as a, at an interval of X minutes. In this particular case, I've said at 10 minute intervals. However, what we can also do in is add a second bit to the query, and I can then filter that data and say, actually, I do want all of that, but I only want it when I'm looking for a particular batch or product or indeed phase. And so I can sort of say, and the filter it, so filter the above data when the, the um, filter tag equals to a particular batch number. Um, and so that's achieved by saying the filter tag is batch number, and the condition for that filter is the filter value equals my, my selected batch ID. So what we're seeing here are examples of how to you know, extend the um, sort of the language that we have available. Now let's try and put this all together then. And um, one of the challenges here is as much as the uh, SQL language, the um, early the, uh, sort of variant of SQL is very powerful, it isn't a sort of procedural or sort of language, but what you can do is you can link things together using a linked server. So in this particular case, what we're able to do here is using something like SQL Server as an example, I can then link it to the historian. And depending upon how I write my query, well, my query comes along for my user and it goes along to SQL and SQL says, ah, oh, well that query isn't really for me, I'll pass that on to the historian archiver and get that data from historian archiver. Or it might say, well, actually, I will pass that data on and get it from historian archiver, but also I know about that data, some of that data stored um, within SQL Server itself. And so this provides a very, very powerful technique to join both sort of historical data sources and also transactional data from SQL Server. And the other really nice idea behind this technique is that there are numerous reporting packages available for SQL Server. So the chances are that if I have a reporting package which works with SQL Server, it supports OLEDB, and I can use it both for historian and for SQL Server data. So let's try and have a look at a bit, a bit of a demo of how this actually hangs together. Um, so what we've got here is we have um, a virtual machine running. And let's just start off by having a look at um, this um, interface here. So this is a, a tool provided as part of Historian for which we can allow, which we can write uh, sort of 
SQL type queries. And so just to point out that we'll start off very simply, and I showed you that earlier, basically interpolation query. We could load it in there. And simply execute it and it returns and, and it returns this sort of information. But perhaps you know we, we can do a little bit better than that. And so what we can also do is that's executing it within this interactive tool, but we could also execute the query within um histor within um SQL Server itself. So this is so this is an idea of a linked server here. And what we can do here is simply say, you know, I've got this query here. And I can then run it. I'm running the query in SQL Server, but it's actually not going to SQL Server. It's routing it out to my historian product. So in this, in this particular case, I run that query and uh, therefore returning the data back into, um, in this case, back, back to SQL, where I could do further processing on it if that's what I wanted to do. And now, so if I could do that, let's try and put this together in a little bit more detail and say, let's have a look at you know, a report that we could create. So this is SQL Server reporting services here. And this is running a, a, an OLE DIB, uh, DB report. And so what we're doing here now is SQL Server has gone away and said, actually, I need to pick up a list of batch numbers. These actual batch numbers are coming from a query into history and it just said give me a list of batch numbers really and then I can select a particular batch and off I go and um, view the details of that batch okay not the most interesting batch in the world perhaps and so what we see here is this data here is being pulled back from SQL and this again is the results of data being pulled back from SQL so here we're using uh, effectively a third party reporting package to pull data back from history So, that, so that's an example of of one of the of one of the interfaces. And now we're going to look at look at another one. Um, and it's really the new sort of REST type um, interface. And these are very very interesting. So this effectively allows me to send REST queries, you know, in the form of sort of HTTP type requests to the a web to the uh, historian archiver and return information. Very much based around client server architecture and it's language agnostic. So that allows me to choose the best pro the best language for this particular job. So you know in my case, you know, I'm a data scientist. Well actually I've got some bespoke specialized Python uh, routines to do with machine learning. Well I can easily connect those into historian. And finally, from the REST interface point of view, security is designed into that interface. Now, there is, there is some excellent knowledge base articles on this, but a word of caution. Um, GE have made some changes between version 7 and version 8, and it's not always as clearly articulated in the documentation as I would perhaps have hoped. Right, but before I can have a conversation here, one of the things I need to do is actually get um, what's called an access token. And so this is one of the first steps you have to do here. You have to go in here and talk to your SQL server and you send it this particular request up here. And to make to serve to uh, to um, issue this particular request, I need to know my server name, understandably, and I particularly I need to know the installation password. When you install Historian, you're asked for an inst you're asked to give it a password. Very important. So you need to make certain that you record that. And you issue that request, and then you will get some form of access token back. And this access token is only valid for a particular period of time. And from that access token, I can then use that um, to, 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 to a query Historian. So again, we're going to have a look at a quick look at an example of that. OK, so again, so this is an, a very quick example of uh, you know, a Python using to, to connect to the REST API. And the first thing I said is I need to be able to get my access token. So I've queried the historian. I've given it. It's I've sent that particular you. I've used that particular URL up here. And I've used to, that initially to use basic authentication 
and with a user name of that and, and my particular password used during the installation. So once I've got that information, I can then go and say to it, well, okay, please get, please get, give me a list of all my available tags. And it will respond with a list of tags, or perhaps I want to know the current values of the particular current values, or I might want to get the uh, sort of last, you know, get the last raw data from it, etc. Or perhaps I want to get uh, raw data by time. I might want, say, the standard deviation of it. And it's done. I'm oh, sorry, raw data by time, sorry. And if I want the standard deviation of it, calculated standard deviation and um, it will return the sort of standard deviation of it. Um, but importantly, what the REST API allows us to do is not only do we, can we query the data, but we can also write back data to it. We can add tags, delete tags, etc. And it, in addition to that, we can also now use it for interacting with our collectors. So we can start and stop collectors that, for example, put them into debug mode, even point them to other servers. So this has been what is, uh, so what we've done here is a fairly quick walkthrough now of the historians of the latest interfaces available within Historian. So uh, are there sort of a a any questions?